Hi, welcome back to 101 Things. This time I'd like to share a very simple software defined radio receiver that can be built using a Pi Pico and a few external components on a breadboard. The original design used a PCB, but today I want to share a simpler, cheaper and easier to build version that works just as well as the original. The receiver covers pretty much everything up to 30 MHz, so that includes commercial broadcasts on long wave, medium and short wave, the HF amateur radio bands and loads more besides. The design is completely standalone, no need for a PC or a sound card, and it can run for hours on three AAA batteries. In this first video I want to make a very minimal but fully functional receiver. In future videos I'm going to use this receiver as a platform for experiments, upgrades and new features. I'm going to try out some new things, see what works and what doesn't. Since I first built this design I've had a lot of comments and feedback. I'd like to start by thanking everyone for their contribution to the project. I know that people have put in a lot of time and effort. I really appreciate this and it's really helped improve the project. I'll start with a quick walkthrough of the design, then I'll try out the receiver and see how it performs. If you want to know more about the technical detail, check out the links in the description. You can find a detailed description of the design along with the circuit and the code. There's also a pre-built firmware image you can drop straight on the Pi Pico using USB. The heart of the design is a Talo detector. This is a really popular design for home-built receivers because it's really simple and performs really well. It can be built using just an analog multiplexer and a dual operational amplifier. The Talo detector converts high frequency RF signals into lower frequency IQ signals that can be sampled using the analog to digital converter in the Pi Pico. The receiver works up to about 30 MHz, but the ADC only has a bandwidth of 250 kHz. The Talo detector helps us bridge that gap. The Talo detector needs a local oscillator close to the frequency we want to listen to. In this design, I'm using the PIO feature in the Pi Pico to generate the local oscillator signal directly. The local oscillator drives a four-way analog switch, which connects the incoming signals to four different paths in quick succession. This creates four samples of the signal, each covering one quarter of the local oscillator cycle. The samples are combined using the dual op-amps to generate an I and Q signal. The op-amps perform three functions simultaneously. They're configured as different amplifiers that subtract one signal from another, amplify the result by a factor of about 800, and the capacitor in the feedback loop works as a low-pass filter removing signals above 12 kHz. The I and Q signals contain all the information we need to demodulate the signals. We can obtain the amplitude, phase and frequency of the signal. Having both I and Q signals allows us to tell whether the frequency of the signal was higher or lower than the local oscillator and by how much. Since building the original design, I've had some feedback and made some improvements. The first is the addition of these two capacitors. They fix problems that occurred at high frequencies where one or both of the op-amps would saturate. I took the solution from the True SDS project, but it works really well here too. I haven't had any problems on the higher bands since I added the capacitors. I have also been able to improve the frequency accuracy of the local oscillator. I was originally just using the fractional dividers in the PIO peripheral to give me a local oscillator frequency close to the one I wanted. This gave a local oscillator frequency which was always within about 100 kHz. That's close enough because the ADC has a bandwidth of 250 kHz. But I found I could get much closer if I also made small changes to the system clock using the PLL. The firmware was originally running at 125 MHz, which gives plenty of grunt for the digital signal processing. But the maximum frequency without overclocking is 133 MHz and there's 23 possible frequencies in this range. If I choose the system clock that gives me the best results, I can always get within 8 kHz of the frequency I want. There are a couple of benefits to this. The first is that the ADC can now oversample the I and Q signals by a factor of 10, which gives much better rejection of unwanted alias signals. The second is that we can use a cheaper op-amp. The original design needed a gain bandwidth product of 60 MHz. This was well within the 215 MHz limit of the LT6231 op-amp, which is an old favourite for Taylor detector designs, but unfortunately this costs about twice as much as a Pi Pico. The new design needs a gain bandwidth product of only 10 MHz. I'm using an MCP6022, which has enough bandwidth and costs less than half as much as a Pi Pico. It doesn't have quite the noise performance of the LT6231, but it's good enough that it isn't a limiting factor. This change is a win-win. It saves cost and improves the performance of the receiver overall. The audio output interface uses a simple PWM design. It's a pretty crude method of generating audio, 
but I'm always surprised by how well it works considering its simplicity. I'm using an RC low pass filter to remove the PWM ripple. Since we're mainly dealing with low bandwidth voice signals, I can keep the cutoff frequency low and the PWM rate high. The IO pin has enough drive strength to drive headphones directly. You can just about drive a small speaker directly using this method, but to be honest, it doesn't work very well and you'd be much better off using an external amplifier and speaker. Active PC speakers work really well for this. You can just plug them straight in and they work great. The user interface is pretty standard. I've used a rotary encoder for tuning and a small OLED display. These displays are very cost effective and don't use too much power. I've also added a couple of buttons and a mini driven interface. You might have noticed that for simplicity, I haven't included a filter on the input of this design. There are a few options you can try though. I put a socket on my design so I could try out a few different options. You can build them yourself or you could buy cheap commercially built filters online. QRP Labs also do a range of low pass filters and band pass filters that you could try. If you just want to try the radio, you can skip the filter altogether. You'll still be able to hear plenty of signals, but you might find that there's a few extra signals where you don't expect them. We'll have a more detailed look at input filters in future videos. I built the project using a breadboard, but I used one of these PCB based ones rather than a solderless one. You could probably use a plug-in breadboard, but I find them a bit unreliable and fiddly. Breadboard construction isn't really ideal for RF circuits, but this build seems to be working quite well. I've tried to keep the wires as short as possible and I've put decoupling capacitors as close to the ICs as I can. The Pi Pico has an onboard switching regulator which can generate quite a bit of noise. I've tried to reduce this by selecting the low ripple mode on the regulator and I've added an inductor to create a separate filtered supply rail for the Taylor detector. The OLED displays have charge pumps which can also be quite noisy. I've kept the OLED display on the noisy side of the filter. I've built a 3D printed enclosure to keep all the parts together. I designed the enclosure in FreeCAD and there are links to the STL files in the description. As this is an experimental design, I'll be keeping the lid off. Before we can try this out, we need an antenna. A random wire antenna in a high location, preferably outdoors or in the attic would be ideal. But if you want an indoor antenna or something a bit more portable, I've had pretty good results using a U-loop it's a clever design that cancels out noise. The only downside is the output tends to be quite low, so you need a sensitive receiver or some kind of preamplifier. I'm just using a cheap white bad LNA I bought online. I've used this setup for all the experiments in the demo. Okay, let's try this out. I'm gonna look at some broadcast stations first so I can see the Taylor detector in action. Some pictures that way, but for, to have the next highest score at four, I mean, talk about carrying your team. <laughs> it's a fairly simple route. Yeah, and there are volunteers to tell them where to go. Now let's see if we can listen to some single sideband voice signals. Hello, this is Italy calling IK6 BGJ CQ. G0 Lima Lima Yankee Stroke Portable, Mike Zero Hotel Delta X Ray in Mallot, Derbyshire. 7 3, all the best, Steve. This is Shannon Volmer. Shannon Volmer. No signal, repeat, no signal. OK, now I've connected the radio to the PC sound card so that we can try out some digital modes. I've set up WSJTX to receive FT8 and left it running for a few hours. Looking at PSK Reporter, I'm getting some quite good results, receiving signals from several continents. Not bad for an indoor antenna. And finally, let's try SSTV. OK, so we've built a very simple software-defined radio receiver. It's a cheap and simple design, so we can't expect it to compete with expensive commercial radios. But considering the cost and simplicity, it's a fairly useful bit of kit, and it's capable of receiving signals from across the globe. In future videos, I'm going to look at making some upgrades and improvements to the receiver. And I've also got a lot of ideas for other projects in the pipeline too. If you've enjoyed this video, and you'd like to see more of this kind of content, why not subscribe? Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.